Bwana sifiwe tena. Amen. We thank God this morning, uh, this afternoon for the opportunity of standing on this pulpit to be able to reason together concerning the heritage that God has given us in our children. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Almighty and everlasting Father, Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we worship you for who you are. We acknowledge that you are our God and beside you we have none other. Thank you for the children that you have given us. It's a great heritage. And we come here to look into your word to see what we can do to be able to take care of this heritage in the best way for your honor and glory. For this we pray in Jesus' name. And all together say, Amen. Amen. I want us to begin by reading Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. The Bible says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now, uh, the scripture says that by one man sin entered into the world. And we know that that man is Adam. Then there is the verb enter that suggests that sin did not start at the Garden of Eden. At the Garden of Eden, sin merely entered into the world. And by reading Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28, we realize that sin had started in heaven when the angel Lucifer rebelled against God, wanting to be like the Most High. The Bible in Revelation 12 verse 4 also shows that Lucifer did not rebel alone. He did so with a third of all the angels in heaven. As a result, Lucifer became Satan, or the enemy of God, and together with the host of angels who had followed him in rebellion, they were chased from heaven. That is how a new spiritual kingdom called the kingdom of Satan or the kingdom of darkness came into existence. And ever since that time, Satan's work has been to fight the kingdom of God and to try to destroy everything that has the stamp of God. I hope you can remember what Christ said about Satan in John 10, verse 10. He called Satan the thief because Satan lives to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And in doing all that, he does not even spare the family. Actually, Satan is the greatest enemy of the family. Now, who started the family and where? When we read the scriptures, we realize that the family was started by God at the Garden of Eden. That is when God made a man the head of the wife and the woman a helper fit for man. And this we see in Ephesians chapter 5 and Genesis chapter 2. So Satan knows the importance of the man in praying his role properly for the success of the family. As a result, Satan has come up with all sorts of strategies to destroy the boy child because he knows that by so doing, he will have destroyed existing families and prospective families. And by the way, it is not only those who have boys who need to know how to help the boy child. No. All of us do. Because even those who have girls only would like to release their daughters to responsible boys for marriage. Amen? Now, in the Bible days, Satan was trying to fight the work of God by destroying the, the boy child. For example, we see him inspiring uh, Pharaoh uh, to kill the Jewish boys when Moses was born. And even when Jesus was born, Satan used Herod 
to kill boys as he tried to do away with Christ when he was a baby. But that was not the end of Satan wanting to destroy boys. No. Because even today, the devil is still at work, crafting and implementing strategies of destroying the boy child. Particularly here in Kenya, we are all familiar with that dispiriting uh, phenomenon of boys who are not studying hard in class. We are also aware of young men who are not enthusiastic or are unfocused when they learn a job. And not just that, we are familiar with young men who are living beyond their means and are now ensnared in the death trap. As a result, they, are, they fall under the category of the people who are said to be financially embarrassed and cannot be entrusted with company money. Perhaps you have even observed the fact that the number of women accountants and cashiers has gone up. By the way, even matatos are hiring more ladies to collect fare. Now, another thing is that generally, young men are taking too long to leave the family house and rent a place of their own to stay, which in Sheng they call Keja. More and more young men are getting past their 30s before getting married. Also, more and more young men have become habitual drunkards and are abusing drugs to the extent where they have lost sense of purpose. By the way, I think about two years ago, I boarded a matatu, and then we reached a stage, and then the makanga said, look out, see how they doze on their feet when they are high on uh, cocaine. He mentioned cocaine. And we all looked out to see what he was uh, ex exclaiming about, and we saw this young man who was actually dozing, he was also almost falling down, but he was still standing. And uh, we heard uh, that uh, uh, he had been given what they call in Matatu Lingo a squad to widow for passengers. And apparently, he had been overcome by the drug while he was still doing the work, and now he was dozing, and the Matatu had gone. You can be sure he had not been paid the money for the work he had done. Unfortunately, a lot of our young people are in that situation and it is very, very, very sad. Now, in Matthew chapter 16, we see Jesus beginning to reveal to the disciples what has brought him on earth, which is to go to Jerusalem, to be betrayed, killed, uh, be buried, and then rise again. Then Peter, the disciple, rebukes Jesus, saying that that should not happen to his master. But Jesus discerns and gets to know that this is actually Satan coming through Peter to discourage Jesus from dying to provide the only blood that could take away sin. As a result, Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. He was not calling Peter Satan, but he was sensing uh, Satan coming through Peter. Now, what does this teach us? In fighting the kingdom of God and undermining things that have the stamp of God, Satan uses people. And in the next few minutes, I want to us to explore a few ways in which Satan is using social agents to destroy the boy child and we see how we can help them change so as to save the boy child. Now, in our discussion, we will be borrowing heavily from the example of Christ, who is actually the perfect example of a parent. Christ is the perfect example of a parent. I don't know whether you have ever read John chapter 1, verse 11, where the Bible says concerning Christ that he came to his own, the Jews, so to say, 
but his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them who believed on his name, like you and me. You can never go wrong by emulating Jesus in the way he dealt with the disciples who were his spiritual children and even how Jesus dealt with other people. Now, there is a general consensus that parents have become too busy for their children. But I would like to us to begin by asking, why should you as a parent avail yourself for your son? My mother is 85 years old and uh, a couple of years ago, he hired this man uh, in the shamba who only went up to standard two in school. Now, this man had a girl in standard eight. And then this man had, perhaps just overheard somebody saying, if your daughter or son can only learn computer, then they are assured of a job. And this man, instead of using the money he had to take the daughter to, stand, to form one, he actually attached her to a local cyber cave in the village, and the girl was there for a whole year. Now, after this one year, then this man overheard somebody else say, even if your son or daughter has done computer and they don't have a Form 4 certificate, they are not going anywhere. They will not get a job. So by the time this man was opening up to my mother, he was now looking for money to take the daughter to Form 1 after losing a whole year. Why am I saying this? It is not enough to bring a child into this world. You need to, help, you need to undertake to help him navigate this world. And doing this one, or doing this, calls for your becoming a student of society so that you can be qualified to help him or her effectively. If you are not in touch with what is happening on the ground, you stand to mislead your son or daughter. And I'm sure we do not want to mislead our children. But apart from reading newspapers and maybe other books, and availing yourself for seminars on how society is evolving, you need also to study the word of God. John 17, verse 17, the Bible says, Sanctify through them through the truth, thy word is the truth. The Bible is the only book that describes itself as the truth because that is true. God's word is the truth. Actually, one uh, newspaper publisher was frank to tell the son, news and truth are not necessarily the same thing. And that way, he was indirectly agreeing with the fact that the Bible is the truth. The psalmist knew this, and he says that he has made God's word a lamp to his feet and a light in his path. That is what we read in Psalm 119, verse 105. Now, first... As a parent, you need to use the Bible to make your son aware that there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. And that the only biblical way of gaining heaven is to repent toward God and place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Actually, in Acts 4 verse 12, the Bible says that there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now, second, use the Bible to help your son to navigate the present world which the devil has filled with darkness. Act 
actually every teaching and every piece of advice ought to be tested with the scriptures. At least that is what we see in the book of First John chapter 4. By the way, there are those who try to fight the devil using their humanistic knowledge only to find themselves in the center of the devil's plan. And that plan is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Let me tell you uh, of a story that I read. There is com this community in Australia that believes that the way to chase demons is through cigarette smoke. And so, everybody in that community is puffing away, puffing away in the name of chasing away demons. And the upshot has been that it is in that place where there is the highest per capita of people dying of lung cancer than anywhere else. So thinking that they are saving their community from demons, they are actually killing it with lung cancer. So what am I saying? Usicheze na shetani. And the only book that helps people to see through the tricks of the devil is the Bible. Buona sifiwe. Now, to guard your son against the tricks of the devil, your son needs the knowledge of the Bible so that he can discern when the devil is suggesting destructive things to him through other people. Uh, I have a friend, uh, an elderly friend. He left the village in the 60s after he did his, that time it was CPE. Started, started seven, it was being done in standard seven. He came to Nairobi. He went to a school in uh, Eastlands and he was there for four years. Actually, it was a day school. Now, when he, was, he, he got to Form 4, that time it was not KCSC, it was being called the Cambridge School Certificate, he wanted to do very well, especially in his beloved subject, mathematics. And he shared his intention with a certain Jamawa Muta. And this Jamawa Muta told him, if you can only smoke bangi on the morning when you are going to sit for your mathematics paper, then you will recall all the formulas and you will do marvelous. And smoking bangi, he did. Unfortunately, the effect he expected was not the one he got. By the time the papers were passed around, his mind had gone blank. He only managed to write his name and then sat down. He had forgotten everything. And uh, by the time the effect wore off, it was a few minutes, maybe half an hour, before the bell rang. And so, he quickly attempted a few questions, and then the invigilator said, all of you put your pens down. And that is how this man performed very, very, very poorly in a subject that he loved, and he had put so much into the whole of his four years. Anyway, as a parent, what then do you tell your son when you avail yourself to hang out with him? You see, our people guided by an, outed, uh, an outed, uh, outdated value system, I'll describe it as outdated, we and our society have been uh, feeding the minds of our young men with toxic messages that produce an unhealthy attitude. Toxic, toxic messages producing an unhealthy attitude. And then that unhealthy attitude has then destroyed 
our young men because it undermines their ability to adapt to the times or to deal with the issues realistically. For example, you may have taught your son that men do not clean the house, they do not cook, or they do not wash their clothes. Then he gets a job that does not pay well to afford him a worker. If that is so, then you should not be surprised if he is hesitant to move out of your house and rent himself a place of his own because how will he do these things? And he has not learned them. Now, supposing your son grew up hearing uh, people say that manual work is for low class people. If that is so, he is likely to decline job offers that involve using his hands or get that job and do it without any enthusiasm. Supposing your son grew up hearing people speak disparagingly about the poor. If that happens to be the case and he learns a job that only maintains him, he is likely to be depressed and even embrace the destructive lifestyle of drinking, so as to tune out of this supposedly unpleasant reality. He may even be tempted to steal from the employer and find himself on the wrong side of the law. Perhaps, or your son may have grown up in an environment where people look down on those who do not live in big houses. This may make him hesitate to leave your standalone mansion or a fear to commit to a girl for a wife wondering, where shall I take her? Where shall I take her? He does not think he can take him, her in a flat and start the family there. It is your responsibility as a parent to debunk any lies that your son might have been fed with by the society and the media and Replace them with the right values that will enable him adapt to the times. Moreover, there is a promise that goes with the investing time in a child. I don't know whether you have read Proverbs 22, 6 that says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Somebody has mentioned that uh, here just a, few, a couple of minutes ago. Mentioned that scripture, that is. Anyway, let your son know that even Jesus Christ prepared food. I don't know whether you have read uh, John chapter 21, this time after Jesus resurrected, verse 9 and 13, we see Jesus Christ having gone to where Kina Peter were fishing and by the time Peter and the other disciples came out of the water they found some bread there and some roasted fish. Jesus had done it. Next, let your son know that Jesus did manual work. By the way, young people even seen see Alikua Fundiwa so Jesus also did manual work. Let your son know that God blesses the work of your hands. So you must work hard in class or wherever you are employed so that God can get what to bless and make you succeed. By the way, even our Lord Jesus worked. In John 9 verse 4, he says, I must work the work of him that sent me while it is a day. Let your son know that Jesus valued the poor. The Bible says he came to preach the gospel to the poor. Encourage your son to work hard. But let him know that life does not begin when one becomes rich. Actually, life begins when one gets to know the Lord, whom to know is life everlasting. As a parent, you need to be careful 
what you emphasize by what you say concerning your son's performance in school. Actually, there are children who do not even like to be near their parents, especially fathers, because every time their parents open their mouth, it is to complain about the children's performance in class, even comparing their children with those of friends who are doing better in class. Let me tell you, your son should experience acceptance from you, and that acceptance should be unconditional. That acceptance should be unconditional. The first thing that you ought to do is to find out your son's strength and challenges presented by his environment so that you do not make unrealistic demands on him. Also, learn to commend your son not just for the marks that he gets in class, but also for the effort, even when he is not performing particularly well. Even more so, Learn to express hope and belief in your son's ability. Refrain from always lecturing him on his performance, especially avoid the disparaging comments like Bona Unashidwa Nawasichana. Avoid such. If you do so, a time comes when his morale is undermined to the extent where he gives up trying. So encourage your son to work hard, but remember also, your son, actually, your son did not go to school to compete. He went to school to be helped to realize his full potential. Your son went to school to be helped to realize his full potential. Now, we have already established that as a society, we are destroying our young people with toxic messages with which we are bombarding them. Also, it is common knowledge that for one to be happy, they must feel successful. Let me repeat that. For one to be happy, they must feel successful. Unfortunately, our society has put the bar for success unrealistically high. You have to have a big house, a big job, or maybe rental income, and a big car. And since these things are beyond most of our young men, and they do not see any hope of affording them, they are constantly nursing mild depression. And you see, this depression makes them prone to abusing alcohol, and drugs as they try to escape from the supposedly unpleasant reality. This is why, as a parent, you need to redefine success for your son and do it guided by the word of God. Anyone whose work gives him food, clothing, and shelter, according to the word of God, is already successful. If your work affords you more than that, it's okay. But being able to give yourself those three alone is a sign of success. By the way, I hear that even in the US, they are actually rethinking what they call the American dream of rags to riches. These days, if any man who works to put food on the table is celebrated. And even here, what I suggest is to si jifunge na jamu. They say so. Na to si funge watoto wetu na jamu. Let us start living the way the new reality dictates so that we do not set our sons up for frustration. Anyway, for too long, the mantra has been, think big. And personally, I believe it is the high time we started to preach the need to start thinking realistically. As the Bible shows, there is more to life than abundance of substance. 
there is more to life than abundance of substance. Now, discouraging words contribute to a feeling of failure, and a sense of failure contributes to identity crisis, because one ceases to feel accepted. On the other hand, encouraging words promote a feeling of success and a sense of belonging. Now, with this awareness, you ought to use encouraging words on your son as much as possible. As a parent, you ought to keep on encouraging your son as much as possible. The next thing, what is the image that you project to your son? In other words, to him, do you come across as a friend? Do you come across as understanding? If you don't, and the peers happen to show him friendliness and understanding, you will have lost them, you will have lost him to them, and they will have all the influence they want. And that way you will have lost him. Whatever they want him to do, that is what he will do. You see, every child is an individual. And every child needs attention. Every child needs affection. Every child needs appreciation. And every child needs acceptance. And you should strive to provide this to each of your children. If you don't, and he is forced to look for attention and acceptance from peers, you will be exposing him to manipulation by peers as he seeks their acceptance. By the way, it is common knowledge that many young men hated alcohol at first. In fact, some used to throw up when they took it. But they persisted and ended up addicted to it. And they were doing that as they sought acceptance in groups that they revered. So, you need to know that you are in competition with, uh, for your son with, your, with his peers. And the way to win the battle is to prove yourself more friendly and more understanding than those peers of your son. For example, if you discover that your adult son has borrowed money through different platforms and he is getting frustrated because the loans have matured at the same time, we call it an unfavorable maturity profile, the first thing to do should be to help him out. Thereafter, you can call him and reason with him to show him the advantage of living within his means or better still, below his means so that he can save for a rainy day. Don't just start by reprimanding him. Don't just start by reprimanding him. Worse still, if you do not come across as friendly and understanding, your son may not open up to you even when he finds himself in a crisis and he may respond to that crisis unwisely. I hate to tell this story that I read in the newspaper of this young boy, or let's say a young man, maybe teenager, who borrowed a bicycle and then it got stolen in his hands. And when he told the owner of the bicycle that the bicycle had been stolen and he was looking for it, that man told him, if you will not have produced that bicycle by such and such a day, you will see. And you know what? Before that day, the boy took his life. As sad as that. Now, if only this boy had shared what had happened with the parent and what he wanted to do, you can be sure that death would have been avoided. After all, I'm sure the money that was used to bury or for the funeral of this boy must have been many, many, many times the cost of this bicycle. Very sad. 
Of course, when it comes to demonstrating understanding, once again, Jesus Christ has no match. I don't know whether you have ever read Matthew 12, verse 20, and heard that he did not break a bruised reed. And we have evidence of that in John chapter 8, when there was this lady who had been caught in adultery, and he was brought to Jesus. Everybody wanted this lady killed. But Jesus saved this lady from her accusers and then told her, go and sin no more. And my question to parents is, how often have you yourself told your son, go and sin no more? Another illustration of how understanding Jesus is, is when Peter was cornered at Caiaphas' place after Jesus was caught. And Peter denied Jesus three times. Then after that, Jesus was crucified. He, was, he died, he rose. And after he resurrected, the next time he meets Peter, Jesus does not start saying, you know, you denied me. We don't see that. If anything, we hear Jesus telling Peter three times, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. Anyway, if there is anything you should seek, it is to make your son your friend from the time he is young. That is how you will be able to influence him for good, unlike the social media and some peers who sometimes influence our children for bad. According to John chapter 15 verse 15, Jesus treated the disciples as friends. And you too ought to treat your son not just as your child, but even more so as your friend. There is something called identity crisis that has been ravaging our young people. And the most effective way of dealing with it is familiarizing our young men with the scriptures and showing them love and understanding. Through the scriptures, your son will get to know where he came from, why he is in this world, and where he is going. Then through your love and understanding, he will acquire a sense of belonging and find life worth living and enjoying. Now, one way by which Jesus demonstrated that the disciples were his friends was by leaving to, revealing to them the things he had heard of the Father. And as we have already seen, you too, as the father or even the mother of the child, you ought to teach your son the Bible or facilitate his being taught the Bible by availing him to the Sunday school teacher. As a good friend of your son, you should also familiarize him with the realities of life as a way of preparing him to navigate today's complex world. They say, for a want is for armed. But do not just paint a bleak picture of the future and leave your son, uh, son anxious, a partner. Promise to be there for him whenever difficulties arise. Let your son not feel left alone in the midst of challenges. He needs to know that you are in solidarity with him. Jesus Christ, who is actually the best of friends, warned the disciples in John 16 verse 33. In this world you shall have tribulations. But he went on to say, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. In addition, Jesus promised to be there with them even when they would be going through difficulties. Actually, the gospel of Matthew ends with these words. I will be with you always to the close of age. Now, the question is, did the disciples experience challenges as Jesus had prophesied? 
Yes. Let, let's take, for instance, Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul was beaten and he experienced shipwrecks. And not just that. One time, as recorded in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 8, he and his co-workers were in so much trouble that they despaired even of life. And by the way, because Jesus was still with him, Paul did not die that time. He died later after writing the second letter to Timothy, where we hear him saying that he had finished fighting the good fight and finished his course. In the same way, no matter how hard things look, no matter how hard things become, your son will become what God intended him to become and accomplish all that God wanted him to accomplish if he commits his life to God. You see, young people today have a misconception, misperception, I beg your pardon, misperception that needs to be debunked. They need to be told this is not true. They think the past was problem free and, they are the, and that they are actually the first generation to experience challenges in life, which is not true. They also think that the past was full of opportunities that were all taken by people of the past generation. Actually, that is why they don't like people of the past generation, supposing that they took their opportunities. Now, how do we debunk this misperception? You need to share with your son your past and let him know that challenges have been there and will always be there. Actually, if you read uh, Isaiah 14 verse 17, you will see that the devil has made this world as a wilderness. Let your son know that life even by the people he admires, is generally lived in the context of challenges. But the promise to be there for him when the going gets tough. In addition, let him know that even if you happen not to be there, God will be there because he himself, that is God, abides forever. And God is a friend of those who love Jesus. Now, you see, the issue is not the existence of challenges. The issue is not the existence of problems. No. The issue is whether the Lord will be there as you go through those problems. The psalmist says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. So, the psalmist didn't fear to have been walking or to be walking in the valley of the shadow of death. Why? Because the Lord was with him. And that assurance is what matters. Because with God, nothing is impossible. So let us tell our children, let us tell our sons that as long, that they are, as, long as they are doing the right thing, as long as God is on their side, nothing shall be impossible and they need not worry. They will accomplish all that God wanted them to accomplish. Now, the other thing I would say is we need to familiarize our sons with work from the time they are young. Let your son know how to wash dishes, dishes, how to clean the house, and even cook. Because in the future, such skills may come in handy. By cooking for himself in the house and not always eating in the hotel, he will save money when he starts to work. And he could also start a hotel business. You see, work has a way of introducing the reality of life in people. You may have observed that children from crowded households have a tendency to succeed. And the reason for this is that circumstances force them to learn skills of survival 
from the time they are young. Of course, here in Nairobi, you may not get space to raise 10 children. But you still can achieve the same effect by teaching your son to work with his sons from the time he is young. Even when it comes to schoolwork, you yourself may be a teacher and may coach your son or even facilitate him, but do not take over the work and do it on his behalf. That is wrong. When Jesus knew he would soon be going back to heaven and leave the disciples with the work of preaching the gospel, we see in Luke chapter 10, Jesus sending 70 of his followers in pairs to go telling people about the kingdom of God. And that way, he was preparing them for the great commission, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, that he would later give them before leaving for heaven. In the same way, let us introduce early what our sons will contend with when they grow up. And that is work. One as if you were. Time is running up, and uh, I cannot fail to say this. That finally, 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 pray for your son. Even after doing your part, never allow the devil to make you start thinking, I have it all figured out. My plan in helping my son is beyond messing. Never let your heart deceive you that way. You see, as alluded earlier, while in this world we are up against the devil, a strong man, Jesus described him as a strong man. And the only person who is stronger than Satan is the Lord, whom we move to deal with the devil on our behalf using prayer. The way to move the Lord into our, situation, into our situation so that he can deal with the devil on our behalf is through prayer. In the book of Job, chapter 1, we see Satan accompanying the Lord angels of God to heaven and then starting to complain to God that God had built a hedge around Job. And this shows us that the Lord and he alone has the ability to shield us from the devil. It is also God alone who can guide our steps in this world so as to be able to evade the traps of the devil. And God steps in for us in response to prayer. Now, this awareness ought to be encouraging even to single mothers who sometimes go through frustration looking for a father figure who can guide their children. Now, if you do not get one, if you do not get that father figure, just play your part of feeding your son's mind with the right values and then commit your son to God in prayer. I don't know when, whether you have read this scripture. Psalm 68 verse 5 that says, The Lord is the father of the fatherless. I can assure you that God is up to and even beyond the guidance and the protection that your son would ever, ever need. And all the people say, Amen. God bless you.